no, we're so, all fixed. John, so, okay. <laughs> it's great to meet you. Where are you located? You. Uh, in Omaha. Omaha, right on. Well, we're close. I'm in Kansas City. Okay. Yeah, so right on. Well, hey, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out. And before we get into your life as a veteran, as a lawyer, I want to get into what we lived through for the last three and a half years. How did you survive the pandemic and how did it change you? Okay, great. You want me to dive right in? or, or it, you, I come from jazz radio, so when we hit that high hat, it just goes. All right. I mean, the pandemic was was a good thing for us. And there, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons for that. What I mean, a good thing for us and that it forced a lot of growth. It was a bad thing for our country, horrible thing for a lot of people. But as leaders, that adversity sometimes will push us to the next level. And for us, we had a plan to go remote the second quarter of 2020, not fully remote, but have that capability because we have uh, lawyers that work through us that, that work throughout the country, and and we had been developing that remote capability, but we didn't have it for the people in Omaha and Lincoln on our team. They still had to come to the office every day, and just as we realized that if we were going to get the best talent, we had to improve our remote capability, and we'd done it before. Uh, the head of my veterans law practice, I think it was 2015, she went to Australia for a year and practiced from there. So yeah. we knew we had the capability to do it, but we didn't invest the resources to make it available for everybody. So then COVID hits and my CTO comes in that, that morning and says, John, um, we're going to need about $100,000 today. I said, what do you mean? He's like, this COVID thing is real. And what you need to do is you need to write me a check because everything, he, and he was, once again, I want to, to clarify, this guy was uh, uh, in, in artillery, uh, well, he was an armor officer and he had been the uh, G, a division level G6, in the Nebraska National Guard. He was the head of the combo for the army section, which is like 5,000 users. So this guy knew what he was talking about, but he had also been in the room during uh crisis planning. And he's like, look, I know what's going to happen. We need to get this equipment. We need to get it right now. And so, uh, you know, so I wanted to say, Hey, do we have a hundred thousand dollars? And, you know, we, fortunately we were able to, uh, cover, cover down on that, but we, we bought the equipment and we started moving right away yeah. by, uh, by Easter. We, we have a great video where we were showing up, uh, around that time with backpacks, uh, with our logo on them full of here's your laptop, here's your whole remote station, here's some toilet paper, here's some Easter candy, like, and we just went door to door, hey, with masks and gloves and everything, you know, but, but it was a great opportunity. And I think as leaders, we look for those opportunities of adversity where we can develop. And once again, a horrible thing for our country, horrible thing for our world. A lot of people got sick. It was, it was terrible. But as leaders, we have to continue to build a future for our team. And when that team feels that uncertainty, that's when leaders step up. And so for us, it was a, it was an opportunity. And I think that anytime you're in a leadership position, that adversity is always an opportunity, at least in the eyes of your team. They're all looking to you for the answers, right? Everybody's scared. Yeah. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, are we going to shut down? Uh, am I going to continue to get paid? Uh, what if I get sick? And you know, we had to say, look, we will take care of you. And in fact, we are going to build a remote capability so that you don't have to worry about any of this. And yeah. so once again, while it was a horrible tragedy, uh, that's where leaders really step up. And it gave us an opportunity too to evaluate some of those mid-level managers to see who really wanted to lead, who could step up and fearlessly uh, take control of the situation. And you know, in those situations, you can only control what you can control. And as leaders, you must control everything uh, within your power. It's like, uh, you know, I guess you're in Kansas City, right? If, if Mahomes throws the ball at Kelsey and Kelsey can touch the ball, he had better catch that ball. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Uh, and and it's 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 the same way. If you're a leader and you can touch the problem, you, you got to fix it. If you can't touch it, then let's let's figure out where else you can help. But that I think was a that was a good turning point for us because it really showed us who was committed. Yeah. Not just uh, to the mission, but to the team. Because keep in mind, we're representing thousands of veterans nationwide, and they're all concerned. Hey, what's going to happen with my benefits? How am I going to get my medical treatment at the hospital? I've got appointments. What's going to happen to those? 
And, you know, then there was talk about how the, the VA hospitals were going to be used to help with COVID. Well, how's that? And so there was a lot of, I, I don't want to say panic, but deep concern about the future. And we had to be the rock for our client. And I couldn't have my team scared, afraid, worried. No, they had to be confident and reassuring on the phone to our, to our clients saying, we're going to get through this. And a lot of them, it was the, the same talk we had when we'd go on deployments. Look, we're deploying. All right. You're going to get every immunization you can. And yeah. then we're going to have your, your protective gear, which might be your pro mask and your entire mop four suit, you know, you have mop, but, but we're going to continue mission. That's yeah. it. We're not going to stop because, because of this. And, and as leaders, uh, a lot, most, at the time, most of our leaders were uh, military veterans and, and they, they had the anthrax shots going to Iraq. They, they, they knew, Hey, that there's going to be a vaccine. There's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be limited activity so that we can stop the spread of this. But, but as, as military leaders, we knew what was coming and we've, we've gone through some rehearsals similar to this. So it wasn't like we didn't know what to do. We knew what to do. The question was, uh, could we do it? We knew what we needed to do. The question was, could we really lead our team? So as a, you know, as leaders, we get tested in times like that, where it seems like the world's falling apart. The team's relying on us. Our clients are relying on us. Can we, can we make this happen? And so for us, while it was certainly a, like I said, a, a tragic time and as you know, the number of uh, illnesses that had long-term effects and, and the deaths was, was horrible. And, and team members, team members were affected by that. Yeah. And, and it's tough. Uh, and that's a tough thing to deal with as a leader, because on one hand, we want to say, we, you have our sympathy. We empathize with your situation and we want to put our people first, but mission always, and we yeah. got to serve our clients too. And it's, it's tough as a leader to, to strike that balance. So you're obviously a veteran. You're obviously a lawyer and a leader, but what did you want to be when you were a kid? What was your dream? You know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I wanted to be a professional football player. Everybody wants to be, I think most kids yeah. want to be a professional athlete or professional musician, right? It's just growing up, you see that the, the, the heroes are on the field or on the stage and you want to be, you know, I mean, I was, yeah, I wanted to be Eddie Van Halen, right? But, yeah. but, 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 you know, when I think as far as a, a career, I had a paper route since I was 10. I started to tassel on corn when I was 13. Uh, I always really loved the idea of having the freedom to, to build something and to, and, and to build a team. I mean, even when I was, you know, 10 years old, I had this paper out and I wanted to wrestle, play football, um, do all the sports. And I did, and that paper out at the time was an after school and you only did mornings on Sundays. So I couldn't get everything done. So, you know, I hired my sister to do half the route. Then at one point I hired my neighbor to do the other half of the route. Right. So now I've got two people doing all the work and I, you know, I still to collect the money and stuff, but you know, I, I, I did most of the paper delivery, but when I needed to, to fit, find a way to do my other activities, I found a way. And I think that's, that, that's something that I, you know, I always wanted to live that lifestyle where I could do the things that I wanted to do the things that I'm really passionate about um, and be able to do everything I want. So, so that's, yeah, that, I think I always knew that I wanted to, to be an entrepreneur. I, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I think as kids, we want to be a lot of things. And I, I think I've done them all. And I, 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 like I said, I don't play for Van Halen and I'm not, I, I didn't play professional football. I did. The closest I came was I went to William and Mary to play football, uh, played two years, mostly rode the bench, but I played with Mike Tomlin and Sean McDermott. Oh, cool. The Steelers head coach and the Bills head coach uh, and both great guys, great leaders. And like I said, they, they played, I, I sat on the bench for a couple of years, but, but the point is uh, that's probably the closest I ever came to, uh, yeah. Yeah. To, to that, to that goal. So speaking of guys like that, who's been a hero for you in your life? You know, there have been a lot, um, you know, uh, members of my team, a lot of members of my team that show up every day. You know, I see them and as a leader, I probably fail to recognize them. But when I see somebody go in there and put in that effort, when I'm having a bad day, it, it just, it just lifts me up. And I have a saying that I say every Monday to our team in our, in our uh, stand to, which is, uh, comes from Rogers Rangers. We attack the, we attack the week before it attacks us. We attack the enemy. We're ready. Uh, we're standing and ready. But uh, I always say, Go out and be a hero to someone today. And I will tell you that the real heroes, um, I, some of them I've, I, I've interviewed on my show, some of them I've served with, none of them consider themselves heroes. That's for someone else to decide, right? But in terms of when I think about, you know, who, who are my heroes, you know, certainly my father, not only uh, is he an amazing lawyer. I mean, I still, when I go to 
other parts of the, West, the Western part of the state, I hear from judges who were prosecutors against him, and they tell these great stories about not only what a phenomenal lawyer he was, but how collegial he was, that after a big trial, they didn't hate each other. It wasn't like it is now where you see a lot of animosity between lawyers. No, no, no. They were all colleagues and they treat each other like professionals. And after a hard trial, a week long, they'd, my dad would take him out for steaks and beers, right? Like let's, let's, we're colleagues, right? We, we fought the battle, but, and we were on opposite sides, but let's respect each other. It's sportsmanship. And, you know, my father also, I mean, he had a famous case in Vietnam of those gallant men where he defended the commander of the fifth special forces and, and won the trial. And, you know, it was, it was, a, it was called the green beret affair. And it was a time where, you know, our country turned its back on its warriors. And that was a, you know, a, Vietnam itself was a disgraceful time for our country, the way we treated treated those heroes uh, who went, fought the battle, came back and we spat on them and we, and, and, and you know, they served. And some of them didn't even want to serve, but they served honorably. And, uh, you know, we really failed them. But my dad wanted to pick up, you know, wanted to make that right. And that's when he started representing veterans. So he was the entrepreneur that started our veterans practice uh, that, that, that now has, has thousands of veterans nationwide. But it was my father uh, who was both a lawyer and an entrepreneur and a radio show host. He was actually paid to uh, do the drive time Lincoln for our, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska for, uh, for about 10 years. So now, you know, lawyers would pay a million dollars a year to do that. He was yeah. getting paid. So uh, my, my father certainly is a hero in terms of pioneer, uh, you know, but I, I could go into so many other heroes, uh, but I, I would be afraid I would leave someone out. But just to say that, you know, I, my current hero, heroes are, are, are my team that, that, that show up every day. Uh, they fight for justice, whether it's a veteran who's been denied their VA disability benefits, whether it's someone who's been seriously injured and the insurance companies aren't paying out or someone who's been falsely accused. We go in the courtroom, we battle it out. And, you know, it's the closest when you get old, that's about all you can do. We can't play sports anymore. Right. I'm never going to see the an NFL field, but I can see a courtroom and I can fight for my client. And uh, to me, uh, that's, you know, that's the closest it's ever going to get uh, is, is, is feeling, you know, knowing that I'm helping somebody um, and I'm going to leave it all out on the field, do everything I can. And when I see my team members doing that, it just, it just fills me with, with joy. Like it makes me feel like I'm successful. And I, you know, my dad, I don't think that anybody is ever really successful, right? It's you have moments of success, but that success makes you feel full in, in those moments. And when you have a team that, that does those things, that, that goes all in, uh, you, you have these moments where you just feel like, wow, I've arrived. Yeah. And then the next day you wake up and you got to find that, you got to find that high again. But yeah. yeah, for sure. It's funny you bring up Lincoln when you were calibrating everything there. My engineer for my radio show, I have a jazz radio show on the market here in Kansas City. He's from Lincoln. His name's John Morris, and he was on the air for a long time. That's where he started, and he tells me all kinds of stories about Lincoln. It's wild. Well, then so, he should know about the John Stevens Berry show in the 90s. Yeah, that, that, exactly. I'm going to have to send him over this interview because he's going to be like, oh, yeah, I know all about it. So that's wild. So he's he's got a show here in Kansas City called The Neon Beat, and it's... um kind of the American song book, the Rat Pack, Marilyn May, that that kind of a thing. So, but it all started in Lincoln. He was just a farm boy that dreamed of getting on the radio and he made it. So it was good. Um, so let me let me ask you this. If you can meet anybody alive on the planet right now, an inspiration, who would you love to meet and talk to? Wow. Um, I would tell you that I've reached out to a lot of people and most of them have, have, have said, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Are you familiar with Casey's general store? Oh yeah. The big gas, you know, it's, I yeah, they're everywhere. How, yeah. Billions. Yeah. I can't remember. It's a, you know, it's, I, I think it's a, it's at least a fortune 500, I believe. Anyway, you know, I had a connection. I said, well, the CEO, I was, I was just researching, uh, veteran CEOs and there's a guy, I believe his name was Darren Revelis, the CEO of Casey's and through a connection, the guy agreed to meet with me for an hour and we did a recorded interview. And this is before oh. I had my podcast and this, you know, and, and he, he was, it was kind of interesting. He was in the sister unit that I was in at Fort hood, uh, first cavalry division, 10 years prior during desert storm. So I was there for, you know, operation Iraqi freedom. And he was, but he was there 10 years, you know, like 10 years earlier. And yeah. so it was, but he was so generous with his time and his, and his, and his knowledge. And I was just blown away. So um, I would say there's, there's probably a hundred, people like Darren that I would want to reach out to if I, if I had the time and could do it correctly. Uh, but I'd hate to, to, to narrow it down to, you know, to, to one person, to one leader, um, that 
you know, I, I listen to podcasts. I read all the time. Um, you know, the, the one person I will tell you that I wanted to, and I got the opportunity was Tim Grover, yeah. the author of relentless Tim Grover was Michael Jordan's trainer. And I got to meet him in a, in a small group setting. And I had this burning question and, and he answered it for me, which was, and just, I don't want to take up too much time here, but so he had this theory that there are, there are three types of, of, of leaders. There's, or team members, if you will, the cooler who will basically will do what they're told, but needs to be do what to be told. The closer who wants to make the game winning shot, who shows up at the end of the game and, and, you know, will deliver. And then there's the cleaner, the person who yeah, is on the team because they are the team. In other words, it's Michael Jordan on the bulls, right? It is the person. The reason why they call him the cleaner is it doesn't matter what mess somebody else makes. They're going to clean it up. They're yeah. going to take control. They don't lose. They go all in and they're going to make sure everybody does their part. And they're going to drag that team kicking and screaming. And so my, my question to Tim Grover was, so as I'm building my leadership team, as I'm building my C-suite, how many cleaners do I want? Yeah. And he's like, you only want one and that's you. He said, because, you know, I, he says, I've, I've seen basketball teams, I've seen football teams where there's two cleaners and there's a lot of controversy and drama. And there's a lot of, you know, it's the two alphas fighting. Uh, and he said, you know, that, that can create a toxic environment. He said, it can work. But if you have, everybody's a cleaner, you know, who's the leader who's going to make the decision. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I, 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 I got that opportunity and it was great to, to meet Tim Grover, to have that conversation. And, it, and that gave me a lot of insight. So I would love to, uh, you know, talk to Tim Grover again. Uh, you know, I'd love to talk to Michael Jordan and I'm not much of a, you know, basketball fan, but just the yeah. way he dominated the sport and, and what he did in the eighties, I think I, I would love to talk to him. You know, I'd love to talk to Stanley, McC general Stanley McChrystal. I would love to talk to, um, uh, well, there's several general officers, but, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, I, I learned, I learned a lot from, um, either while I was in the military or just reading some of their, their memoirs. So, man. I, I can't answer the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> you did answer the question. Absolutely. So it's funny that example of the cleaner, it's like, that's why you can't put two betas together in a tank because they'll just go at it. You know, they'll eat each it, other. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so of all of the good work that you've done, all the veterans that you've helped, what's been one of your favorite success stories? Well, my, my favorite success story is, is, you know, my father's success story that really started it all. So my father started off, you know, he, he was practicing law in New York City. Uh, his mother fell ill, so he came back to the Midwest. And he's helping all these veterans just naturally came to him because they knew he was a veteran. He was solving other legal problems. And he found that a lot of this had to do with, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, which was at the time called shell shock. And so um, a, a veteran came to my father. My father was representing him in another legal matter. And uh, my father got him uh, service connected through the VA and got him treatment. And then this veteran said, well, you're the only person I know that does this. And I have this, uh, I have this friend of what's called a friend, Tommy. Tommy had been homeless for almost 10 years, lived under a bridge, had filed claims with the VA in the 1970s and nothing happened to those. And so Tommy had an alcohol problem, drug problem, homeless, uh, obviously mental health issues. And this is all stemmed from his, his post-traumatic stress, which wasn't being treated because when he went to the VA back in the seventies, they basically said, well, there's really, you know, nothing wrong with you, whatever. And he filed a claim and nobody did anything with that claim. And so what, what my father was able to do is get him service connected, get the back pay to go all the way back to the seventies. So all of a sudden this guy goes from being homeless to a six figure back pay award. And now he's getting uh, thousands of dollars a month to, uh, get his life back to the most important. He's now getting treatment from the VA for yeah. his addictions, for his post-traumatic stress. And so uh, this man buys a house, gets married, has children and starts a small company, right? It was, and it was all there. He knew everything from, from the military. It was the basic lessons and the discipline that he had. But when his life fell apart, we, the people were not there for him. You know, yeah. we really we as a society failed him. And um, so my father was the one that, uh, you know, fixed that, made that right. And, and, you know, I can tell you stories of, you know, injustice, of false accusations where I've tried criminal cases. My wife has tried them. Uh, you know, I can tell you cases where, where big insurance companies have, have, have bullied people and, and should have paid. And, and, but the people who take on those cases, those are my heroes who, yeah. who take on, right. The, the, the tough challenges or help someone build a better life. Just, you know, just, 
<laughs> serve your fellow human. I think so often people talk about they want to change the world. If you could just change one life, help one person, right? It, it, that's great. I mean, it's, I think that unfortunately we live in a time where people think that, you know, you're going to take massive action. You're going to see massive results. And that's, that's the key to, to change. And I would say that's not the key to change. It's one at a time. And even in business, I talk to people, Oh, I've got this great business plan and I'm going to do this, this, and this, and I'm going to, you know, have thousands of customers. I said, wait, have you sold it to one person yet? Right. And the same thing, I'm going to win all these trials. Have you won one trial yet? Yeah. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get all this. I'm going to make all this change. And have you helped one person yet? Because it all starts there, right? It all starts with being able to help one person. And look, it multiplies, right? So think of, I think of it this way. Um, there was a book, and I think it was called uh, Endless Referrals. And I, I can't remember the author, but he wrote a book called Endless Referrals. And he was like, look, everybody knows at least 200 people well enough that they would refer a case to you or refer some type of business. So what if, you know, you just had one client, what would you do with that one client to treat them in a way that if you couldn't get any other business that they would want to refer people to. And, and the answer is you would provide outstanding professional service, but you would also provide outstanding customer service and you would deeply care. You wouldn't yeah. just have this relationship where it's, it's transactional. You would want a real relationship with someone that you want to see succeed and you take their success personally. And I think, unfortunately, we live in a society where everything is so transactional but it's the relationships. All of my biggest cases have all come from referrals and, yeah. and they've come from people who I know, like, and trust. And then I get the case. And when I get the referral, the person already trusts us, which as a lawyer is huge because they are generally more likely to follow our advice and people pay us a lot of money and then don't follow our advice. And it's so frustrating. I'm like, what? I don't understand why is this happening, but this is also why we like to work with veterans because yeah. veterans understand, Hey, you know, in a, in a chain of command, they understand sometimes you don't need to know all the whys you need to trust your leaders and follow and follow, follow their advice or, or their orders. So, you know, for me, I, I, I've lived a blessed life, but it really, I think it's because I, I see the world as, you know, if I can help one person today, if I can be a hero to one person today, that's all I need to do. And, and, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, I can look at it and say, did I do something? And, and I'll just tell you, I have days where I struggle. Where like, did I help anybody today? I have days where as a leader, everybody would have been better off if I didn't show up at work because I made some bad decisions and maybe, you know, I was maybe too, you know, sometimes I get too focused on the wrong thing. And, you know, I like to charge maybe too many knife hands, you know, too many in your face instead of asking questions. So as a leader, I want to be the person who can every day at least help one person, um, which is tough because, you know, the, the more people under your charge, the more pressure you feel. Yeah. I mean, as a company commander, you know, I went to Iraq and this general said, you know, your job out there what's your mission and we were talking about you know the, well our mission is you know in iraq and we we're talking about all the things you're doing he says no no no. your mission over there is to take care of america's sons and daughters who are right now under your charge your job is to do your best to bring everybody home yeah and and and, and when you're a leader in an organization that's what you're thinking i got to make sure that i meet payroll so that i can take care of my team so and i, I got to make more than payroll so i can provide them bigger opportunities i got to grow this so that i can be the, you know i can be the leader that my team needs but we get so caught up then in the big decisions because quite frankly, the big decisions could, could result in the end of the company, right? They could mean something great or they could mean something horrible. And so you're making these big decisions. You're thinking through the, the big problems and then you lose sight of, but who, what, what, why are you doing this? You're doing it for the team. And if you can't look down at that individual team member and really see them, see them, see them working, see what they're feeling, see them pushing themselves because they don't feel seen. If you can't make them feel seen, then you as a leader are failing. And so for me, that's where I've, I've really struggled. I've, you know, the, with a big vision and wanting to help team members and scaling the organization, it becomes very tough to pull yourself from this, you know, ethereal place, right? Your, your echelons above reality to come back into the line and say, wait a minute, it's not about like the big vision as, as much as it is making sure that the whole team sees the vision and that I help them achieve it because the yeah. vision isn't just mine. I may be the person who thought it up, but my responsibility is to make their part of it real. And where's their vision? What's, what's it for them? So I would just say as a leader, the most important thing that you can do every day is just get that one, help one person, help one person, because that will always keep you grounded. It's like in the military, you know, uh, 
people would say they were fighting the war from, uh, you know, uh, where was it? Tampa in Florida, right? I, it, and they call it Tampa stand. Well, you're not really boots on the ground. You're, you're, you're in Florida. You're not, you know, but I, I think that as leaders, we want to be boots on the ground, but we don't want to be too present where the, everybody feels suffocated and micromanaged, but we want to be there enough to know, let them know that we care and enough so that we can make a difference in their lives every day, at least one person on the team. Absolutely. So if anyone wants to listen to your podcast, hire you, reach out to you, learn more about you, where's the best place to go? So if you want to learn more about the Veteran Led Podcast, uh, Veteran Led on just about every single channel, we're the, on every social channel, we're there. All right, so just 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 search Veteran Led. Um, if you, you know, for veterans that need help, PTSDlawyers.com is in post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, we're, like I said, Barry Law, spelled like the fruit, B-E-R-R-Y, Barry Law, post, uh, PTSDlawyers.com. We have an 800 number, 888-883-2483. Surprised I remember that. <laughs> right on. John, this has been wonderful. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your story, for your time. You're doing wonderful work. Best of luck. Have a great 2024. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for all that you do. Yes, sir. Thank you.